This morning, I do have a word that the Lord's kind of been playing with me on. You know, it was, uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to see how, how far I can get into this because there's just so much that I've been processing and even in my own self and, and, uh, and the season that we're in right now. But it must have been Monday night or Tuesday night. No, it was Monday night. Must have been. It, it was about 4:20 in the morning. I have a habit. Whenever I wake up early in the morning, like out of normal, I look at the time because I just don't wake up in the middle of the night, you know. So I always look at the time. And just that night, it was 4:20 in the morning, and I didn't even snap about the 4:20. I was like, oh, that's my scripture, you know. Uh, but it was 4:20 in the morning, and as I'm sitting there, <clears throat> I'm like, okay, God, I'm up. You know, I didn't hear nothing, so I'm just sitting there in my chair, and I'm just kind of like, like in that, that zone, you know. <clears throat> and then right at 437, the Lord begins to speak to me. And this is what I heard the Lord say. He said, a pain that pushes you through. A pain that pushes you through. <clears throat> you see, many of us find ourselves in a season that is so unfamiliar some of us are in a season of, of healing. Some of us are in a season of transition. Some of us are in a season of growing. But you know, every season that we find ourselves in, it's an important season because every season, it's always a teaching season for the Lord for us. It doesn't matter what it looks like, literally. It doesn't matter what the season is. The Lord is always trying to teach us something and always trying to show us a better way, no matter what it looks like. <clears throat> When we find ourselves in a season where everything looks and feels foreign, come on, I'm, I'm going to, I've been there before. Like, what am I doing here, God? I mean, I remember being in that season when we first, when the Lord first moved us out of, out of Texas. Listen, we were, I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. As far as I had gone was maybe Dallas. I wasn't a, I wasn't doing itinerant speaking. I wasn't doing anything. And all of a sudden, the Lord just says, I want you to give up everything you know, leave everything behind, everything, and move to Alabama. You see, so you find yourselves in a place where, what the heck am I doing, God? When it doesn't make sense in the natural, but in the spirit, the Lord is always trying to do something to help elevate us, right? Because, see, his plans for us are always good. We know that to be true. <clears throat> The reason why this happens is because the Lord is stretching our views. He's expanding our tent pegs, and he wants to give us new vision. Sometimes we, we put ourselves in a place of familiarity. Come on, I'm just going to be honest. This is, you know, and and, and I, wanna, I want you to hear my heart when I say this, because see, transparency will always bring breakthrough. That's true transparency will always bring breakthrough. And I found myself at times feeling like in a place of familiarity that because I'm so familiar with my surroundings, I'm no longer being effective in the kingdom of God because I no longer being, begin to uh, step out and expand my view. Because I was staying in that place of my comfort zone. I remember my, you know, this is just something the Lord's reminding me of, but I remember my baby brother. I have a little brother. And I remember he loved sushi. And he would always tell me, man, you got to try this. I said, heck no. I am not going to eat that trash. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's raw. You're going to get worms, man. Something's going to happen to you. And but because I was so afraid, I'm telling, and I still am afraid of oysters. <laughs> but because I was so afraid to expand my horizon, to expand my possibilities of enjoying something new and different, that I didn't do it. It wasn't until maybe like four years ago when I was in Alabama. When me and my wife drove by this place called Rock and Roll Sushi, I said, you know, let's go in there. 
go in there. I'm looking at all this menu. I'm like, what is Topico? What is spicy mayo? What is all this crazy stuff? I said, look, let me have the Michael Jackson roll. <laughs> Didn't even know what was in it. But man, that thing changed my life. <laughs> Whew. Oh, I love sushi, man. But I would have never known how much I loved it until I tried it for the first time. You know what I'm saying? So we have to begin to, to expand our horizon. Now I'm getting hungry. I'll tell you what, there's a place over there in Defiance. Ooh. I'm not going to give no plugs unless they want to endorse us. But, man, it's called the Dynamite Roll, and it is amazing. Oh, man, cream, cheese, smoked salmon. Man. But see, I wouldn't have known that. I would have been terrified of that. You see, our natural mind wants to wrap around things that are going on, but it doesn't understand. Meanwhile, our spirit is resting, it's waiting, and it's anticipating. You see, that's where the battle comes. Because see, in here we're like, man, what's, what's going to happen? What's next? How does it look? What do you want me to do? You want me to do this? You want me to do that? How does it even work, God? How does it work? But your spirit is like, oh, you just have no idea. Your spirit is resting. It's anticipating. It's a show. Oh, go deeper. Go deeper. Because it knows what's about to happen. It does. Our spirit knows. Why? Because it's aligned with heaven. But our mind gets in the way and it stops us. Our spirit knows what heaven is already declaring. <clears throat> you know, these past two weeks, maybe three weeks, definitely two weeks for sure, I have found, we have found ourselves doing more counseling with people nationwide and locally, just abroad, than I have had to in a long, long time. And I don't mind it, but in the process of seeing everything, the Lord is allowing us to see the scheme and the plan of the enemy. And there's one thing in common that everybody that we've had to counsel or we've spoken with, one thing in common with every one of them, it's this, it's the unknowing. It's the unknowing. Because they don't know what it looks like. And because our mind can't wrap around it, it'll, the unknowing will keep us in bondage. It'll keep us in a place of not being able to step forward. It's the unknowing of the season. It's the lack of understanding, even the attack in the season. It's the unknowing and the unfamiliarity of the season that you're currently walking in. Because see, listen, when you say yes to the Lord, and you begin to move into a transitioning say, a phase of your walk with the Lord, things don't look the way we think it's going to look sometimes. I'm going to tell you what, man. I remember when we moved out... And we, we wound up in this small little city in a, a city called Florence, Alabama. Population about three. Not literally, but small city named Florence, Alabama. And what we thought what it was going to look like didn't look like that at all in our mind. But the Lord came in and he began to show us things and began to teach us and begin to mature us. Because listen, what we went through in Florence, Alabama, led us to Birmingham, Alabama, which led us to be trained and equipped for this season that we're in right now here in Ohio. Had we not done what we were supposed to do there, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing right now. It's the unknowing of the feelings and the emotions that are attached 
to the season that you're in right now? It's the unknowing. Like I said before, some of us are in different seasons. We're growing, some are maturing, some are stretching. But every one of our seasons is God ordained for us to be able to, um, for us to be able to learn in the process. These things have caused pain in the season. You see, the Lord told me at 4.37 in the morning, he said, a pain that pushes you through. I said, Lord, what does that even mean? Like, what does that mean? You see, these things have caused pain in the season. Some of us have felt abandoned. Some have felt betrayed. Some have felt the leading to be disconnected from a season. So we should have all our Bibles today. So let's turn to uh, Jeremiah 37. We're going to turn on Jeremiah 37, and I'm going to start at verse 11, because I'm going to talk, we're going to talk about Jeremiah, and then we're going to stay here just for a little bit, and then we're going to move forward, because he, Jeremiah, he had to push through a pain. He had to push through a pain, a pain in the season so let's talk about what Jeremiah, let's just talk a little bit about Jeremiah. It was funny because me and my wife were talking about this the other day. And, and I was like, she wanted me to go to do something. I said, no, I got I to gotta spend time with Jeremiah. <laughs> I hear, I hear uh, Brandy's voice, Jeremiah. <laughs> but let's start in verse 11. And it happened when the army of the uh, Chaldeans left the siege of Jerusalem for fear of the Pharaoh's army, that Jeremiah went out to Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to claim his property there among his people. So Jeremiah is going to reclaim the very thing that belongs to him. <clears throat> and when he was at the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the guard was there whose name was Erijah, I, I probably said that wrong. The son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah, and he sees Jeremiah the prophet saying, You are deflecting to the Chaldeans. So Jeremiah was in a season of going to reap and take back what was, was his. And in the process of him going to get what was his, the enemy comes and begins to falsely accuse him. And he says, you're deflecting to the, the Chaldeans. Then Jeremiah said, false. I am not deflecting to the Chaldeans. But he did not listen to him. So Erijah seized Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. Therefore, the princes were angry with Jeremiah, and they struck him. And they put him in prison in the house of Jonathan, the scribe. For they made that the prison. When Jeremiah entered the dungeon and the cells, and Jeremiah had remained there for many days, then Zedekiah, the king, sent, took him out, the king asked him secretly in the house, he said, is there any word from the Lord? Come on. So now, let's just think about this for a second. Jeremiah was just trying to regain what was his. Then he was falsely accused. How many of you have ever been falsely accused? 
he was falsely accused, and then in the falsely accused, then he was put in prison illegally. And not only was he put in prison illegal, but the, the very people that put him in prison had the audacity to say, hey, do you have a word from God for me? Right? <laughs> I would have been like, yeah, get me out. <clears throat> and Jeremiah said, then he said, this is what the word he gave him. You shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Moreover, Jeremiah said to the king Zedekiah, what offense have I committed against you? Against your servants or against your people that you have put me in prison? Where are your prophets now? The ones who prophesied saying that the king of Babylon will not come against you or come against your land. Therefore, please hear me. Oh my Lord, the king, please let my petition be accepted before you. And, and do not make me return to the house of Jonathan the scribe, lest I die there. Then Zedekiah the king commanded that they should commit Jeremiah to the court of the prison. So I guess because he had found a little bit of favor, he took him to the court of the prison. Like he took him out of the main prison, but he still put him in the court of the prison, right? He's still in prison. And then he says that they should give him daily a piece of bread from the Baker Street until the bread in the city was gone. Thus, Jeremiah remained in the court and the prison. You see, sometimes we go through seasons in our life that we don't understand. Even in the midst of hearing the voice of the Lord, even in the midst of surrendering to God, even in the midst of good doing, saying yes to the Lord, Jeremiah still endured the false accusation. How does he push through the pain? Come on, let's just be, let's be honest. I remember being in those seasons, being in, in, in front of people, being falsely accused. And I remember what it felt like to have those darts thrown. And, my, and the Lord says, keep your mouth shut and keep your heart pure. Watch what I'm going to do. Watch what I'm going to do. We push through the pain. <clears throat> so now, Sephatiah, <laughs> the son of Matan, Gildiel, the son of Peshur, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, man, Lord Jesus, help me. And Peshur, the son of Malachiah, <laughs> heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken to the people, saying. So come on. So Jeremiah is being a voice to the Lord. He's being obedient to the season that God has for him. And he's telling the, the king what's going on. But the people around him, they begin to come and they accus bring accusation. And they tell him. See, they heard. They heard what he was saying. He said that Jeremiah had spoken to the people saying, Thus says the Lord, He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes over the Chaldeans shall live, and his life shall be the prize to him, and they shall live. Thus says the Lord. This city shall surely be given to the hand of King Babylon, which the army shall take it. Therefore the prince said to the king, Please let this man be put to death. Thus, he weakens the hands 
of the men of war who remain in the city and the hands of all the people speaking such words to them. For this man does not seek the welfare of, uh, the welfare of the people, but their harm. Then Zedekiah the king said, look, he's at your hands. Still, the pain. Now, not only did, was he in the court of prison, but they came with more accusations, and then they tell him, okay, take him away. Then Zedekiah says, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and they casted him into the dungeon of Malachi, the king's son, which was the court of the prison. And they let Jeremiah, listen, you got to know what a dungeon is. I mean, it's not like you're, you know, like you're in a small cell and you got with your cup. No, it's a dungeon. It's a black hole. There's no light. There's no windows. There's spiders on the wall, man. There's black, you know, I mean, it's horrible. So they, they brought him down and they cast him into the dungeons. And it says that they led him down with ropes. Can you imagine? They had him tied up and they're... Can you imagine? Can you, can you visualize that? And they're slowly just dropping him down. And they're lowering him down with ropes. And in the dungeon, there was no water but mire or mire. Am I saying that right? Mire? And it says, so Jeremiah sank in the mire. Mire is... It's the, it's the grime, it's the, the mud, it's the, uh, yeah, what? Yeah, it's, 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 you can imagine, there, there's nowhere to go to the bathroom, there's, it's urine, there's, there's fecal matter, there's, there's grime, there's, it's horrible, it's a dungeon, and they lied, and, and to the point where it's just that he couldn't even walk, it was that thick. Mind you, he's falsely accused. And he's doing everything that the, God, that the Lord told him to do. But he pushes through the pain. He pushes through the pain. Jesus. Now, Ebed, Melech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs who was the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. When the king was sitting at the gate, Benjamin, Ebed, Melech, went out to the king's house and spoke to the king, saying, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet whom they have cast into a dungeon, and he is likely to die from hunger in that place where he is. For there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed, Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Take here thirty men with you, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies." So Ebed Melech took the men with him, and they went into the house of the king under the treasury, and they began to, they, they took the old clothes and the old rags and let them down onto the ropes. Listen, I think that's a prophetic thing that they went into the king's treasury and they began to get the clothes. And it says that they threw the clothes down and they told him to put well, let me just read it. It says, and Jeremiah did so. And they said to put the ropes under the armpits and the clothes, and they began to lift him up. You see, when you begin to push through the pain, what happens is the Lord begins to lift you up. And, 
He lifts you up out of the season. He lifts you up out of the, the mire. He lifts you out of those, those areas that you can't understand. You don't know why you're enduring the attack because you've been faithful. You said yes to God. But why is this happening? Why did it happen to Jeremiah? What did he do wrong? Nothing. He was faithful. As a matter of fact, he was so faithful that he was the voice of the Lord. He was the voice of the Lord, the prophetic voice of God. And even then, he had to push through the pain. As we push through the pain, the Lord will begin to elevate us. And I begin to ask the Lord, you know, what, what it's all about. I just wanted to share that quick story about Jeremiah because, see, something kept him going. Because even to the very end, if you go down two more chapters, I think it's a verse, chapter 40, it says how Jeremiah was released and there was breakthrough that happened. But there was something that kept Jeremiah in a place of pushing. I can't imagine what it was like, man. I'm just being honest. Being in that place of, of total, I mean, nowadays, somebody gets upset with us and we get offended. Man, we shut down. I don't want to talk to nobody. I want to sleep all day. Depression comes. Anger comes. Bitterness comes. All these things come. Jeremiah endured something, but he kept pushing. Never once did he get offended with God. Saying, God, I'm here in the dungeon. What, what's up, God? I'm swimming around in my own poop. All because you wanted me to speak your word. I'm t- Come on, let's. And I asked the Lord. Because see, I believe this. We, we need to take a step back and seek the Lord in all things. You know, we've been talking in the, in, the, in the School of the Prophetic on our Tuesday nights that we have to learn how to recognize the voice of God, the voice of truth. Because the voice of truth will always speak life to you. The enemy will always speak death. It'll speak death to a season. It'll speak It'll speak division. It'll speak discord. It'll speak all those things. So we have to recognize if we're experiencing anything outside of life, whose voice are we hearing? It is vital and it is key that we, the bride, stay in close connection with Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter how seasoned we are. It doesn't matter how amazing of a minister you are. I don't care how much Bible you know, how prophetic you are, how apostolic you are, how evangelical you are, whatever. It, none of this matters. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved either. If our hearts are not aligned with the Father's heart, then we are open for an onslaught of attacks from the enemy. I, I've, I've, I've personally have endured this. There are seasons that I have been in rebellion, knowing the Lord. I've been in rebellion. I've been offended. I've been hurt. And in those seasons of me being hurt and offended, I opened up my spirit. I opened up myself to allow more demonic assaults against me because I chose to live in the mire. We have to recognize the voice of the Lord. You know, I want to speak to the house right now. And those that are watching, if this applies to you as well, but I really want to speak to the house. 
This house is strategic and it's God ordained for the seasons. It's not just for Northwestern Ohio or just Ohio, but it is a blueprint for what God's going to do in the nations. It really is. It's a blueprint. God is, is showing us a way to be effective. It's teaching the sons and daughters the reality of who they are, who God is in them. It's paving a place and a safety net for the bride to be trained, to be equipped, and to be launched. Listen, this is not just a church. I, I, I get that. Some people, they need the church. But we are the church. We are the church. Everywhere we go, we are the church. But if I'm speaking to the house and I'm speaking to the whole, this is an apostolic center that God has strategically placed here in the Ohio area to equip, to train, to launch, to be a safe place for those eagles, to fly, to soar. It's teaching the fatherless how to father. It's turning fathers who function as orphans by bringing them life of true sonship. Allow me, I want to I I expose some things right now. We're going to expose the current scheme of the enemy. Because once we bring corporately to light of the areas that seem dark, then our spirit will catch the wind. Come on, listen. Our spirit will catch the wind, which will detach ourselves from the untruth that is attempting to create residence with inside of us. See, that's a plan of the enemy. The plan of the enemy is, is, to, is to create a place with inside of us to make our this its home. And if we allow the enemy to come and make its home in our own self, in our own walk, in our own life, what happens is we begin to function in that place, no longer speaking life, but we agree with death. And when I say death, I mean, I'm not meaning dying. Anything that speaks opposite of life is death. I was uh, talking to a good friend of mine the other day. And uh, he wrote something on his Facebook wall. And I said, man, I said, bro, you have no idea. That is so on point right now. And this is what he wrote. Because, see, this is an apostolic ministry. I need you to understand that. And when I say apostolic, I'm not talking apostolic with the long dresses and the buns in their hair. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a ministry that is functioning in the fivefold. Establishing heaven here on earth. Walking in the signs, wonders, and miracles. The builders. The repairs of the breach. And he said this. When people are connected to an authentic apostolic ministry, the biggest warfare that people, the people that are connected in that ministry will face is this. It's the warfare in their mind. Because see, if the enemy can get you here, then it'll stop you from agreeing what's here. And what's here comes from here. The rivers of life flow from the belly. And we agree with that from heaven. And it'll stop us from, from entering into the very promise that God has for us. He goes on to write, it's the warfare of the mind. The enemy will release onslaughts of thoughts 
delusions, illusions, deceptions, suspicions, inaccurate, in erroneous, and vain imaginations to attack the progress. The advancement. You see, you got to understand, I'm speaking to the house. As you align yourself with apostolic, as we, we begin to see the fivefold being established, what happens is the enemy knows the power that comes when a fivefold ministry is being established. When the, the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists, the apostles, they come together and everybody begins to function in their proper place. That we all become leaders that are destined to lead. That it's not one man behind the pulpit, but it's every one of you being a voice for the Lord. You see, the days of, of the church, and this is no disrespect. That's just not where we're going. The day where the pastor runs the whole show, Man, come on. I, I, I'm running from that. I want to see you guys do it. I want to see everybody positioned in a place. That's the Father in me. That's the apostolic in me wanting to see everybody elevated. That we can kick back and say, wow. Man, look at them go. Jesus, look at them go. That's what burns in my heart. And that's, that's why my heart aches when I see others not see that for themselves. Then I'm like, Lord, don't let them miss it, God. Don't let them miss this opportunity, Lord. Lord, lower down the ropes, God. Begin to lift him up, Papa. Lift him up. Lift him up, God. Because we got to push through the pain. Because it is difficult. Transition is hard. It is hard, guys. It's difficult. But it's so worth it. Even the most difficult times that I've ever had in my life, when I just wanted to throw in the towel, my wife will tell you, listen, I'm transparent. I'm like, listen, I told my wife, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to do this no more. All these years, and all I do is get attacked. All I'm doing is loving people. I'm just loving people, but I'm the bad guy. You see, the devil's a liar. He's a liar. Every one of you has a destiny and has a purpose in this place. And because you have, you have aligned yourself with something greater than all of us, there's going to be attack that comes. But it's because the devil knows the outcome. The devil knows the outcome. I'm telling you what, we are on the verge of a move of God that we have never seen before. And we all get to be a part of this thing. It's not about Alice or myself. It's about what God wants to do. And we just say yes. We just partner with God. Is this making sense? He goes on to say, we have to be led by the Spirit for real. <laughs> I thought that was pretty awesome. Because we all say, well, the Spirit of the Lord is leading me. No, it's not. It's your emotion. Let's not get them confused. Because the Spirit of the Lord will always lead you to life. Always. We must let the Spirit of the Lord lead us for real. Because the enemy has an agenda, and his agenda is this. Uprooting people out of the places and away from the people that they are supposed to be connected to and assigned to. That's the plan of the enemy. He wants to get people uprooted. 
That's the enemy. An apostolic ministry carries the authority to establish and mobilize those around them. We're getting thousands and thousands. Listen, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. We're getting thousands and thousands of people that are contacting us via Facebook, through emails, through all over to the websites, watching what God's doing here. Striker, a lot of people in Striker. Listen, we did a video for Striker. It's got like 5,000 views already in Striker alone. And there's healing and there's restoration that's coming. Listen, Emerging Streams is not about Striker. It's not about Brian. It's about what God's going to do in a region. I didn't come here for Striker ablaze. Hear my heart. I love Striker. But man, I want to see Archibald Little Blaze, Wasion, Napoleon, Defiance, Brian, and all the other little places that I don't know the names of yet. I want to see all of those places lit ablaze for the glory of God. That's why I get so blessed when I see my brother and sister here come. They drive almost two hours to be here. But it's because something stirs inside their belly. There's something about heaven aligning up with them and saying, God, I don't know what it is, but I want that. Man, we all need to be like that. Amen? God is raising up a generation of sent ones. It's those that have been tried and tested by love. And they're motivated by the Father's heart. He's bringing an alignment to those who have been wandering for too long. And we're seeing the fivefold being established, and it's in motion. So I want to get back to the whole 420. <laughs> Jesus, thank you, Lord. Father, you're so good. <laughs> you're so good. So at 4.37 in the morning, I heard the Lord say, a pain that pushes you through. It's time to push through the pain. And I began to get reminded about all the different ways that Jesus endured pain and how he, was, he suffered. Even under dire circumstances and attacks, and even accusations. You see, because sometimes we forget this very thing. We forget that Jesus is the Word made flesh. So when Jesus came to earth, He came as a man. He was tested as a man. That means that he dealt with every possible thing that a man would deal with. And, and I know sometimes we have this picture of, of Jesus, like, like he just walked around with this glow around him everywhere he went. And you see like the pictures where he's halo. And there was a glory on God. There was a glory on him. But guess what? His feet got dirty when he walked. He got blisters on his feet. He didn't have the Nike shocks. He had to go to the bathroom. He had to clean himself. He had to shower. He was a man. John 1.14 says this, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we might ask, what does that mean? Like, what does that even mean, right? 
you know, we think about one of the moments right before Jesus launches into his ministry. He's on this 40-day fast, right? And I, I've shared this a little bit before, but have you ever gone 40 days without eating? I've never gone more than a day or two without eating. But after the day or two, man, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm weak. Man, if I don't have my coffee in the morning, I'm like, oh, God, I need something. So Jesus is on this 40-day fast not eating nothing. He's tired. He's hungry. He's a man. And he's at the very weakest moment of his life. And the devil comes to test him. He tests him. Matthew and Luke both talk about it. He tells, the devil tells him, create, create bread out of stone to, re, to relieve your own hunger. He tells him, leap from a pinnacle and rely on the angels to break your fall. Right? Kneel before Satan. And I'll return all the kingdoms of this world. At that moment, and I'm sure there was many moments before that, but at that moment, the temptations were hedonism, egoism, and materialism. And it's referred to as this, the lust of the eyes the lust of the body, and the pride of life. Those were the temptations at that moment. And I'm, I'm thinking this, and I'm saying, Lord, because it's 4.30 in the morning, you know, and I'm praying, I'm saying, God, what was it? What was it that kept Jesus from failing? What was it? I said, why didn't he quit? He was a man. And I know we, would, we, we can answer that question and we'll say, well, well, he was a son of God. Well, yeah, he was. But he was still tested. I said, Lord, what kept him from failing? Why didn't he quit? And I didn't hear the Lord give me a definite answer or like an audible voice. But in my spirit, this is what I heard. He says he didn't quit and he didn't fail because he saw the end result. He saw the end result. He saw the it is finished. He pushed through the pain. Everything that he endured, he pushed through the pain. And I said, Lord, what is the pain all about? All of us that are enduring this pain, God, what is it? He said, it's your birthing pain. He says, I'm trying to get the bride to birth. I'm trying to get them to see the baby that I'm giving to them in this season. I'm trying to show them what it looks like to give life and to bring life. He didn't quit. Jesus didn't quit. He pushed through the pain. Every dagger of the spear, ah, oh, that's for my daughter. That's for my son. Every whoop, every affliction, every part of his walk, he saw the end result. 
He saw what was going to happen. He saw the victory. Every one of you, listen. There is victory, victory. You are called to live a victorious life. Even though it feels like you're in the dungeon. Even though it feels like you're trapped and you're in the murky waters. Even in that time, the Lord is saying, I'm going to lift you up. Just wait. Just wait. And the Lord gave me this scripture. And it's coming out of Psalms 43. Jesus, thank you, Father. And it says, vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against ungodly nation. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send out your light and your truth. And let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and your tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God. My exceeding joy. And on the harp I will praise you. O oh God, my God. I want to speak vision to you this morning. Every one of you that is a part of this house, God has purpose for you. He has destiny for you, even those that are watching online. It's time to push through the pain. The Lord is wanting to birch something. And let's, let's stand up this, this morning. You want to come up? Yeah. The Lord is wanting to push to the pain because see, some of you have been carrying this baby for too long. You've been carrying it for too long. And I don't know what it's like to give birth to a baby. Praise God. But I remember when I saw my sons being birthed. And there's a pushing that comes. And though it hurts, and though I saw my wife in the agony and the pain and the crying and the travailing, ah, the contractions, the, the pushing, it hurts. But right after the baby is born, when they put the baby in your hands, every bit of the pain is gone. The Lord is wanting to birth something with you guys this morning. I really heard this morning that we have to get to a place like in Psalms 46 where you tell the Lord, it is well with my soul and quit fighting the very thing he wants to do inside of you. And sometimes you have to just stop the wrestling with God and just say, God, whatever it looks like, I don't get it and I don't understand it sometimes, but it's well with my soul. And this pain that he's talking about, you know, sometimes we have to say to God and say, it's well with my soul. I guarantee you when he was going through the process of becoming, see, there was a process that God had to, go, that Jesus had to go through. And he couldn't walk away from that process. And some of us, the enemy's been really pressing us to walk away from the process of things. 
And it's like, I don't want to go through the process. I just want to get the end result. And God's like, no, I got to take you through the pressing of the process. Because if I don't, you won't be changed. And you'll continue to be in hurt and pain and suffering for the rest of your life. And I'm trying to bring healing to you. And I'm trying to bring wholeness to you. So in that place of not understanding, you have to say, it is well with my soul, God. Yes, I'm hurting. Yes, I'm in pain. Yes, this is difficult. Yes, this process is hard. I guarantee you he cried out to his father when the process was hard. But in that hard process, he told the Lord, it's well with my soul. I'm in agreement with the process. I'm not going to run from the process. I'm not going to act like everything's okay in the process. That's why transparency, it brings breakthrough. Because you can't just stand there and, and say, oh, I'm good, everything's okay. No, if you're not good, it's okay too. It's okay if you're not okay. It's okay if you're not good. It's okay if you're hurting. Because God wants to come to you in that hurting place in realness. And, and, and he, wants to, he wants to just heal you. And he wants to come put his hand on your chest, on your heart, and those places that need healing. And it, it's no longer like, man, I want to walk away from the process. It's like, okay, God, let me be refined in the process. Let me go through a refining in the process that you're refining me. Because what's the ultimate goal of the Lord is that we look more like our papa. That's why we have to go through the process and being refined in him. But as we push through that pain, it's well with my soul, God. Whatever you want to do, pushing through the pain, God. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's hard. But I promise you, the end result that you're going to get, he's faithful in it. And he shows up every time. He, you know, the Lord always takes me through this encounter that even when you walk in the valley and you walk in the darkness and you walk in these places with him, because, you know, even in the wilderness, you're walking with him. You don't just step into the wilderness and then he, he leaves you. Even in the pain and the, the wilderness times of your life, he's right there with you. But he's walking you through that process because at the end of that, there's a light that shows up. And he's trying to bring you closer and closer to catch the image of the light of him, of who he truly is. And when there's light, there can't be any darkness anymore. So even though it feels like you're walking through some stuff, the Lord is on the other side and he's saying, come on over, just keep walking. But I don't know what's down here. Like Jeremiah, like he was talking about Jeremiah. Jeremiah probably didn't know what was on the bottom of that mud. When, when it's nasty, ugly, nasty stuff that you're walking through, you don't know what's on the bottom of it. And I don't know about you, but I don't like walking through stuff like that because it just freaks me out. But I know in that process in faith, God is calling us out to come to the deeper things of who he is. The process brings you closer to him. The process brings you deeper in relationship with him. The process of the birthing that Pete's talking about even this morning is that we we see the glory not the glory just in a corporate in a corporate setting but the glory God's put in each and every one of us that through the pushing and through the pain that God's going to show up so powerfully and all of us together doing this together in unity brings tremendous breakthrough for a region tremendous he's he, he's working some things out in all of us and in that working through things we're gonna look more like him I promise you there is the light at the end of the tunnel I promise you he's never taken me through a wilderness time or through a refining time that I never came out on the other set on the other side looking better feeling better he always is faithful and he brings us through. And it's so powerful and it's so good. So that way you can stand up and you can give a testimony of his goodness in that process. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to open up the altar as we worship. Whatever the Lord puts in your heart. And we're going to pray.
if anybody just feels they just, you can stay where you're at. You don't have to come up, but I, I'm going to open up the altar. Father, we just thank you, God. Father, we just thank you for your presence, God. And even now, Lord, I speak, I speak blessings. I speak your favor, God. I speak your increase, God, even now in the name of Jesus, God. God, we break every assignment of the enemy, God, even now. And I speak life, God. I speak life, God. And I speak connecting, connections. Right now, I come against disconnecting. I come against any lying spirit. I come against any hindering spirit. Right now, Lord. Father, that we would push through the pain. Even now, Lord. Father, we push. Right now, Lord. We push, Lord. I speak purpose and destiny right now, God. I speak life, God. Life abundance. Jesus. 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 God, I pray that mindsets would begin to shift right now, God. Oh, the days of thinking small, God, have to end today, God. The things of thinking little, God, have to end today, God. God, we think big, God. We think about your kingdom, God. That when we wake up in the morning, God, it's not about us, God. It's about your kingdom, God. It's the kingdom that pulled you through the pain, God. It's because you saw the bigger vision, God, of the souls, the souls of harvest, God, that were going to be saved by your blood, God, saved by your offering, God, saved by your sacrifice, God. And, God, we just align our minds. We align our hearts. We align our souls. We align our spirit with heaven this morning, God. Robo That we begin to think big, God. God, I pray that you begin to strip our upbringing, God. Strip away the upbringing and the way we think, God. Get rid of all the old things, God. The old mindset, God. Robo Oh, give us a new mindset, God.